Do you hear that? No, not that. That. This one moment just awoke something in many people, I'm sure. This was the childhood of many, many people, myself included. When I was a tiny little bab, I played MapleStory 2. I was partial to warriors and thieves, bandit in specific. The idea of hitting something eight times with a single attack was too awesome to me. Many a day was spent sitting in Kerning City, waiting for my party's turn in Kerning PQ. Oh, that's Party Quest. Basically a dungeon, but in MapleStory it was a monumental event, with only 40 channels available and each one guaranteed to have some party occupying the PQ. You had to fight for your entry, and even actively use the in-game tracking mechanics to track a group's progress through the PQ. When they reach the bonus room, you know it's time to go serious mode. Then when you hit 35, it was time for Ludibrium PQ. God, what a time. My progress typically ended by level 60. I didn't have the inclination or time to spend hours and hours fighting mobs to level up one time. So I really never got far, but it still left an endless impression. That and, well, as he tells it, my brother was part of the OG Windia crew. If you know the name Heffa Heffer or Fallen Stars, you may have also known my brother. Maybe bought a Zakum helmet from him. Being related to basically early MMO royalty probably helped instill a very early imposter syndrome too. How could I live up to someone all but running a server with his plus 10 attack work gloves? But of course, time goes on, other games come and go, but the memories remain. The impression the game made, for better and worse, remains. Anyone who knows the game also knows about The Big Bang. This seems to be where the game started to extremely reinvent itself. Faster and brand new EXP curve, massive overhauls to basically every system, new ones, and what seems to me where the actual story of MapleStory starts to be built. As far as the game is now, the inciting plot is the Black Mage returning after being sealed away centuries ago. The point the game kinda actually begins at level 200, yes, level 200 is where the game begins, with a level cap of 300, is where the Arcane River begins. And the Arcane River is how you progress to fighting against the Black Mage's forces and all of his cronies. And if I recall, the Big Bang was caused by this same Black Mage. I came back around some point in Big Bang for like, two days. I tried out the super cool new Dual Blade job. It was essentially a bandit, but used a dagger and katara combo. It was so cool and neat and... cost real money to buy your skills. Oh, right, free to play game. And MapleStory is probably one of the most infamous examples of such games. So being unable to use most of my toolkit, I quit. Anyone who has been keeping tabs on me, or even just read the title of this video, knows I got to experience the worst depressive spiral in my entire life. Learning someone you respect is a giant transphobe, and realizing the people you thought cared about you are probably the most toxic people in your life, will do that to you. And apparently those things lead back to the wondrous world of MapleStory. It's basically a completely new game. Anything I knew from the old days is basically no longer true, and 20 years of content is a ton to shift through. For all my memories, I've become a newbie again. I've become a brand new player to MapleStory. So let's talk about my experience as a new player to MapleStory in 2023. And who oh boy did I pick a time to rejoin. The middle of a hyper burning event that allows you to gain three levels every time you level up once, up to level 250, a daily login reward giving me a second burning character up to level 150, the Halloween event giving me a third burning character up to level 200, Sixth job coming very quickly along in November, with other massive changes, and more! So I was kinda able to make a large amount of progress in a relatively short amount of time. And you know, I'm having fun with it. Because at least in the reboot server, Dual Blade isn't literally pay to win like the rest of the game. Oh, I should explain what that is. Reboot server is the server that isn't pay to win. The other servers, most of your end game progress is paid for with real money. If you want to feasibly progress, like, at all, you will be paying real money or grinding in for mesos, the in-game currency, hardcore. On top of that, trading is disabled in Reboot. Most items you could want to obtain you will have to earn yourself. The in-game items you buy with real money, you could buy with mesos in Reboot. So with enough time you actually can progress. 
Not like the other free-to-play games or even the normal maple servers where people will cope and argue it is pay for convenience. Yeah, five times the convenience because Reboot has a five times meso and item drop rate. Yeah, uh, nobody believes you. Apparently Reboot is the only reason Global Maple Story, hereby called GMS, currently still exists. The normal servers and the whales I suppose aren't enough? Or maybe people mean it spiritually? I don't know. But in my limited time back, it's been a very, very common sentiment that GMS exists entirely off the back of Reboot. And you can kinda see why with the play accounts. These bars are how filled each channel is. Channels basically being the world instance system in FF14, but permanent. But yeah, it's actually pretty fun. I made decent progress, especially because of burning. Speed of leveling massively slows down when you hit Arcane River. Again, the content that basically is the real beginning of the game. And I was still able to get a character decently in, and others to Arcane River too. This is where the infamous and ever expected massive grind of MapleStory begins. The gear curve up to like 150 is just use whatever drops from enemies. Maybe get some decent drops from killing bosses. But then you fall into a rabbit hole of like 20 different systems that all matter extremely tons of a major lot. And that word soup hyperbole of a statement is still not enough emphasis on how important all of the systems end up being. Every piece of normal gear comes attached with a minimum three different mechanics. Some items can lack one or more of these, but most follow these rules. First we have these stars at the top. This is Star Force. At most a piece of gear can have a max of 25 Star Force for the highest level gear. Each level of Star Force gives more stats with a higher chance of failure to increase the level every further upgrade. This costs me so and an absurd amount the higher you get. Then good news, after rank 15, the item can be completely destroyed by a Star Force upgrade. Assuming you can even get up that far, from rank 21 to 22 is a 7% chance for the item to be lost. Have you ever pentamelded in FF14? Imagine if instead of a 7% success for the final slot, you actually lost the entire item you spent billions and billions of meso on to get to 21. And good news! I've seen more than one guide and video. People mention you want to be hitting 22 stars if you want to be an endgame player. Oh, and even better, imagine if when melding your fifth slot for a piece of gear, a failure meant you had to redo the fourth slot. That's how it is here. After 15, if your star force fails, you lose a star. So even if you don't lose the item, a failure is still lost progress. Then there's bonus stats and flames. When a piece of gear drops, it can come with a number of bonus stats. Some flat increases or something like plus 5% to all stats. If an item does not have bonus stats, you can add a flame to it or reroll the stats the same way. Maybe you got a bad roll with the first flame and want better bonuses. This can also cost billions to get a good flame. Then there's potential. Not all items come with potential. If it doesn't, you need to find scrolls that can add potential, basically upgrading the base rarity of the item. There's four levels of potential. Rare, Epic, Unique, and Legendary. Obviously the higher tiers are better and can have better multipliers. Like say, plus 3% of your main stat for Rare versus plus 12% for Legendary. There's multiple systems in this too. You can get up to three lines of potential stats on your item. If it has less than three, you can use stamps to place more on them. Then there's cubes. Cubes will re-roll these potentials like flames do for bonus stats. Got a bad potential? Re-roll. Then there's the rarity that can be upgraded. There's special cubes that can permanently upgrade the rarity of the potential if you get lucky. You buy these in the cash shop, even if you're on reboot. That's some dark pattern shit if you ask me. And that's just for one piece of gear. Do that for like 10 pieces of gear you have. 22 stars, good flame, good legendary potentials where all three lines are good. Oh, and there's inner ability that is essentially just the potential of your character. This, unlike everything else so far, is with honor EXP which is very hard to get in large quantities. This can also be upgraded to a permanent legendary stat, but only for the first line and by pure luck. That's uh, a lot to take in, right? 
Hell, I'm leaving out most of the information too. I didn't even mention stuff like familiars and how those have potentials too. There's so much more to it and it... It really makes you appreciate the simplicity of FF14 gearing. But hey, it's not all bad. It's very comprehensible if you find something that actually properly explains it instead of throwing buzzwords at you. Let's talk about something more fun for a moment. MapleStory has a lot of jobs. I mean, a lot of them. Over 40, and apparently they're all viable. If you thought the coming 21 jobs of Dawn Trail was a lot, this is even more insane. Though, Maple has a good 10 more years on FF14. Yes, the game is 20 and still going. Jeez. But yeah, there's a ton of jobs. You could pick the Basic Explorer, the original choices back in the early days of Maple, or you could go for Dual Blade, my main and the reason the original Big Bang disappointed me. Or maybe one of the heroes who sealed away the Black Mage like Mercedes, apparently pronounced Mercedes, or the terrible Blue Mage that is Phantom, or the plucky Kana and her pet fox, or... Is... Is that Mob Psycho 100? No, wrong one. Yeah, that one. And he's... Listening to his iPod? Is that... Bullshit. But, yeah, there's a lot of options, and you can't go wrong, unless you played Jet, who got entirely removed. But there's bursting-based jobs, sustain-based jobs, and even support. So you're almost guaranteed to find something you enjoy and want to main as you make new characters to play all of them. Like I said, I picked Dual Blade because of... Oh, did you notice I said you will play all of them? You think I'm making a joke or being presumptuous? No, no, my dear viewer. You are the one presuming too much. I mean, play all of them. Every single one. Sure, maybe not all at once, maybe over the period of months and years, but you will play every single one. And it isn't like FF14 where it's incentivized or just fun to do. It's another one of those requirements if you want to progress. There is the system that is Link Skills. Link Skills are special passive buffs, and sometimes very rarely active skills that you can give to the other characters. And these aren't exactly small or basic buffs. Let's take a look at Mercedes. At level 70, you unlock her Link Skill. This is a 10% buff to EXP gains and to teleport to a very specific town every 30 minutes. At level 120, it upgrades to 15%, then at level 210, 20% increased EXP. In a game that is infamous for grinding, 20% permanent gains to your EXP is absolutely huge. Or how about that blue mage I hate playing? Depending on which level tier you're at, you will gain increased critical rate of 10, 15, or 20%. Given Dragoons have been like meta since Heavensward, partly off the back of Battle Litany alone, a permanent 20% increase to crit rate should sound amazing to you. And that's an additive 20%, up to a cap of 100%. Or let's take the Demon Avenger which will give you 5%, 10%, or a whopping 15% damage up. Not just crit rate or anything, just outright increased damage with no other requirements. And then the partner job Demon Slayer will give you an additional 20% damage to bosses. Only bosses seems bad, but like 20% is a huge increase. Even at level 1 or 2, 10% and 15% is a big boost for being just a passive effect you can equip. So you can equip 12 of these link skills depending on the situation and what synergizes best with the job you're playing. And you can have a set for fighting normal monsters and a set for just bossing. This makes sure that you aren't wasting a slot during a moment you're not fighting bosses or such. But if you can only equip 12 skills, why not just grab the, say, 20 jobs or so that have link skills you want and ignore the rest? 20 should cover both normal enemies and bosses, right? Ignoring that that's still a ton of jobs, well, yes, you're right. You probably only need that many at most, not the full more than 40 jobs. Well, because you're missing out on even more stats. There's the Legion system. 
Not only does this give you a special currency that can buy those mentioned potential scrolls and other items, but applying jobs to your Legion will give you not only the listed stats on the Legion board, bonus stats based on which job it is. So while Demon Avenger comes with a basic damage up a link skill, the Legion skill is a small buff to your boss damage like the Slayer. Plus, the higher the level, the more space the job takes on the Legion board, up to, I believe, five slots. And more space on the board means more of those buffs from the board itself. So yeah, you're playing a lot of jobs because it's essentially permanent account progress, at least for that server. Imagine if playing Dragoon gave your bard an extra 5% piercing damage to replace the old disembowel effect. Hell, you remember old cross class? And how in Heaven's Word there were Dark Knights who never got provoked from playing any tanks before? So trying to do something like Bismarck Extreme was literally impossible? Well that was only a good 30 levels, maybe a day or two of work at most. Now imagine if a huge chunk of your damage was locked behind thousands of levels. I've seen the term 6k legion, which I assume means 6,000 levels worth of characters, which would be a good 30 characters at level 200, likely a bit higher to hit that 210 link skill, or more characters. This obviously is super long term progress and all that, but like, the amount of times I've seen people talk about it like a normal goal, as a new player this is extremely overwhelming to know. Sure, I want to try out tons of jobs since 1 to 200 isn't too bad, but like, that much? The in-game chat is even worse. Sure, in FF you might see people mention some weird abbreviation, but you could just ask. In Maple? Ha, huh, good luck. Between the spam of people throwing money at cash shop items, yes, Maple does that shit with announcing whenever someone gets cash shop items, you see Smegas. Smegas, or Super Megaphones, are basically world chat. People from anywhere shouting all different kinds of things from boss recruitment, guild recruitment, to bigotry. As far as I found, these are real money only. So communication outside of a guild is just basically nothing. You think it's bad you have to go to a main town in FF? This is even worse. Though not like I'd really want to communicate based on something I'll get into later. I came back basically just for mindless grinding. I wasn't joking in my relic video about wanting grinding. Instead I got system after system after system and no real proper knowledge base to make sense of it all. One of my only interactions with the wider community was wholly negative. There's so much information over the years and so much of it also presumes you know a bunch already. If you ask the community, or at least the part I asked, they will yell at you for not knowing and tell you to just check more guides. Through 20 years worth of guides made and no way to know what is or is not relevant still, or is or is not quality. There's a good reason I try to mark videos of mine as legacy when they're no longer valid or have an updated version. Multiple guides I did try to look at marked as for newbies would say things like Make sure you MSE and pump your IED to 85% to be able to do CRA. You know how through this video I made sure to explain what a lot of terms meant even offhandedly, including something like channels? The videos explicitly marked newbie guide will have word soup like that and at no point define what the hell they are talking about. What the hell is the point of a guide if I need a second guide just to understand it? Again, there's a reason why I try to define stuff in my own guides. I'm not perfect, but there's a real effort put into at least define once at least. And even then, I've been asked to be redundant and repeat definitions more. So that these guides completely and entirely ignore these and often are barely 15 minutes long, what? Let's define them together then, shall we? I think I got this one wrong in the order of how people put it together, but it means main, secondary, and emblem. These are three gear pieces that can have potentials of plus attack, which no other items can get. 
So getting a good MSE is key for upping your damage, right? Lines of legendary ranked attack up. Yeah, that's a lot at once. We'll push you a lot further. IED means ignore enemy defense. For doing bosses, you need a good rate of this. Bosses have something like 300% defense or something? I read somewhere that stat, but yeah, ignoring defense that high is kind of important. This advice is saying 85% is the threshold you should hit to be able to do full damage. It's optimal. Then there's CRA, which means Chaos Root Abyss. Chaos is the difficulty, with Root Abyss being a set of four bosses. These fights block a really important stepping stone of gear. And beyond that, I couldn't tell you more because it's never said. Nobody and nothing I've seen actually ever said why CRA gear is so good or such an important stepping stone. Given what I've seen of other items, I assume it's base stats and built-in bonuses of extra boss damage. But otherwise, nobody ever says why. Some guides talk slow but slur and mumble their words. Others are loud and clear, but speed so fast you can't catch everything. Especially with all the different accents you go through on top of abbreviation soup. I try and speak clearly and at a proper pace, and usually I'm happy with it. But geez, I put way too much effort into it if this speed is reasonable. I just checked a beginner guide that was 30 minutes long, but had an hour's worth of talking. Double the speed of this video? And that guy was probably faster. Hell, even a basic event guide is completely impossible to understand. The Halloween event has a minigame involved where you fight a boat striking dummy. The goal is to do as much damage as you can for some extra rewards over the normal daily cap. The guide, like five different times, refers to this as doing your punch king. Punch King is an event that anyone coming in afterwards will have no goddamned idea what you're talking about. It's like the terrible FF14 raiders who call donut-shaped AoEs Dynamo. We get it, you're old and did T9 when it was released. Normal people have no goddamn clue what you mean when you say Dynamo. If I have to Google what the hell a Punch King is to understand what an unrelated event is, then you have failed at the most basic of explanations. Maybe if Punch King was something the game has expected me to do before now? But it hasn't? Hell, you know how I was very specific in telling you how Link skills and Legion are basically the same progress? I checked more than one Link skill guide, and none of them mentioned Legion in the slightest. And all of them had comments from people saying, but why didn't you mention Legion? Because the systems are basically one and the same. But hey, people are pretty sure that Link skill guides are all still completely up to date, despite the fact that there have been jobs like Jet Removed and others like Beast Tamer unavailable to create. And any guide that has basically any suggested ordering for obtaining Link skills includes both of these options that literally aren't options. So how am I supposed to know that every job is even on this list? Meanwhile, the video guides that are from 2023 just tell me this character has this link skill, which can be found basically anywhere. I'm looking for a guide on something that can have an efficient or more useful order, not a list. I don't want to name the creators because I would find that just rude and unfair. To be even more fair, I've only seen a very small snippet of their content, and I don't know them personally to be bad people, like part of what actually brought me here to begin with. It makes people who follow the Maple creator space unable to properly analyze this experience I had, but like, I don't want to do that to specific people. Especially because one guide in particular is so bad, it's to the point of misinformation and genuinely angers me. And according to the comments, this guy was someone established. While this is annoying, I don't think it's worth naming names for this either. If not for a generous commenter, I might not have known the difference between this being a good or bad guide. But like, do people remember old Astrologian? How one of the cards could reduce skill cooldowns? Where burst windows are so highly emphasized in FF14, misaligned cooldowns was actually objectively bad. And also based on RNG, or random chance. 
As just one example of bad advice, this guide recommended my dual blade should run cooldown reduction as an inner ability. While this could maybe be good in soloing since only my burst windows matter, 20% cooldown reduction is not 20% cooldown reduction. It's a chance at cooldown reduction. So it's random and can ruin your own personal burst windows. This is instead of say 20% boss damage guaranteed. 100% active damage in bosses where cooldowns matter most. If not for that commenter, I would have never known it was a random chance. The video was unstructured, unscripted, and a rambling mess. It does mention that it is only a chance, but barely and glosses over it to the point that you don't even realize he said it. Combine that in with the mumbling, because he's also mumbling, and they essentially didn't. Most of the advice I was able to glean was swiftly debunked with evidence and reasoning that made perfect sense. Further commenters agreed in the replies. This is the quality of the guides I'm told to use and figure things out for myself. Newbie guides that are incomprehensible, guides that are incomprehensible because they're not made for newbies, and guides that are actively wrong. No list of what guides I should check, just go watch guides. And from apparently reputable names. If anything, I think it calls for us to all reevaluate the importance of creators in MMOs. I went from the experienced player making guides for newbies to the newbie unable to find guides that I can actually use. It re-emphasized to me personally how important it is to try and get things right. How important scripting is and making sure it's able to be understood by a new player. Just the whole process. Generally, I am proud of my work, but it's hard to look around and see people recognizing each other daily. If my work did matter, my peers would mention me or recognize me. Not because I'm special, but because I am equal. 60,000 subscribers is really a lot. That's huge. Hundreds of thousands of views on videos. That's a lot. But how am I supposed to know I really am making the difference I want to make? That misinformation video? I despise everything it represents. Unintelligible, incorrect, and misleading how many people. There were comments in that that said they got good advice from it or were happy with the guide and such. I get those comments all the time too, but I don't have peers affirming I got things right that I'm not a complete fuck up and people only think I've been helpful. A newbie insisting I've done so much to help them just might be someone whose experience I ruined and the doubts flood back in, starting the spiral all over again. That video represents everything I am afraid to be, everything I fear I am. I don't want fame to be famous. I want recognition to know I truly am helping so I can keep helping, head held high knowing that even if I make a mistake, it can be corrected and shown among a body of work that is trustworthy. In a way, that video has shown me ways I can improve. It's shown me ways that I exceed my expectations. I'll never be a good black mage, but I can promise myself that I helped many people understand basics and nuances and put all my effort into it. I scripted and reworded and re-recorded lines over and over to make sure they come out clearly as best as I can tell. I don't know how much more of Maple I will play if I will push further into the mid-game or what, but if nothing else, I can say I relived some memories, had some decent fun, and got an unexpected reminder about content creation. For everything I dislike about myself, fear I do wrong, all that, well, maybe I should give myself a little bit more credit. Maybe not a lot, but not none. And only in my content. But maybe there is something done right here. But hey, I didn't go into this for a pity party. Comments about it usually actively hurt me. So let's get back to Maple. Would I recommend playing Maple as a free MMO for when you want to unsub from FF14? So many people complaining there's nothing to do with half my achievement score. They should go and play something else like Yoshida says. Maple can be one of the things. 
No. No, very much no. If you play of your own desire, make sure you play on Reboot. But even then, no. On top of all the things I mentioned with progression being meso-based and taking billions of meso per item, the game is very, very ugly. Like, not in a visual way. Look at these maps, enemy designs, everything. The game looks amazing just because it has an art style you cannot ignore. Look at the skill animations and the six job ultimate skills coming out. Boss encounters at the high end. There might be effects overload. I mean, look what grinding is like without turning skill opacity down. But they all look really good. You genuinely cannot call MapleStory ugly visually. There's awkwardness with player character sprites all looking like, well, this. But enemies and backgrounds and everything. There's a very talented art team employed here. Now, when I say ugly, I mean the UI. The UI is absolute shit. But also, I've been spoiled by FF14. In the bottom right is your skill bar. You get two lines of 16 hotkeys for a total of 32. You can customize which keys are what, and you can use basically the whole keyboard for skills, even ones not on the skill bars. Like, I have some skills on function keys, and those aren't on my skill bar. I can use those buttons fine. However, when you have the skill bars rolled out, you can't reach the menu buttons. You have to roll them up to reach the menu buttons. There's a hotkey to move it in and out, but I want to have both out. And maybe a third row of skills? And also bigger and not so goddamned tiny, which also buff icons are equally tiny and impossible to tell what your cooldown is? Those tiny numbers for FF14 skill cooldown timers before they added the big in the middle option? Better than what MapleStory has. Everything is tiny, and your only option for increasing the size of any of this is lowering your resolution. Not the game, your monitor. Despite the game having options like this for high resolutions, this is what the game looks like when in windowed mode. Despite being on the 2K setting, and full screen records like this, though it looks more like you've been seeing during the rest of the video. And when tooltips are like this, like, what the hell? It makes understanding skills way harder when the text is this tiny and no way to really buff up the size. Maybe if the text boxes were opaque? Instead, the semi-transparency can be impossible to deal with. Try reading white text on a light background. And while there is a font size slider, that's for the chat box only. Oh, and for weird potential complaints, you can only move using the arrow keys. No WASD. The WASD option they give you in the character creation is not that. So like, there's some major hoops you have to go through to just play the game. I assume it's some kind of technical debt from being 20 years old, because why else have such a terrible UI otherwise? People hate 14 for its tech debt? Maple is buried in it. The weird resolution stuff is almost guaranteed to be due to age, among dozens of other problems too. Some of the stuff we have in FF14 is just a million times nicer than Maple's unresponsive UI. Oh yeah, that reminds me, the UI is stupidly unresponsive. Do any inventory management without tearing your hair out, and it is a miracle. It might take you five or six attempts to move an item to the slot you want it in. Just God. Oh, and while writing this part of the script, the game just crashed. I wasn't doing anything but typing in a YouTube comment. Literally AFK in game and doing a special event thing where you get EXP for being AFK. The game can crash for the smallest things. And apparently that includes literally being AFK. So I'm going to just not write the rest of this section because nothing can be a better example of how often the game struggles under its own weight. Not only did the creative side of things make me feel better, the game really recontextualizes FF14. For all the things MapleStory does right, the things it does wrong are magnified when looked from that mindset. I could forgive the bad skill bar if I could up sizes of it all, and some more opacity options. But you want one thing that really, really, really dates this game to the point of absurdity? The pre-rendered cutscenes you get for some quest lines? 
It literally plays video from, like, YouTube or something. You can even see the video bar at the bottom of the screen for a second. They uploaded the video, filmed a screen capture or something of the video on the website, and used that as your cutscenes. Or maybe even, like, somehow direct connecting to YouTube itself? I have no idea, but, like, what even is this? There's other issues I can have here or there. Some stuff I can praise, like the maple guy doing a good job of giving you direction through 20 years of content. Could be better, though. But, like, that covers about the long and short of it. If you want to play Maple Story in 2023, going into 2024, you have to come to terms with issues far worse than FF14 at its worst, and a level of grinding that can very easily burn you out. Ironic that the events they give you are called hyperburning. But if for some reason this got you curious like it did me, I hope you have a lot of fun. I did. The game is still satisfying in its own way, still trying to do its own thing. If you really can't help it, make a main and just don't bother with Link skills and Legion unless the game really catches you. Just don't play Phantom. For the love of God, do not make Phantom your main. Thank you for following me into the Spiral of Maple. I hope you enjoyed this little foray. Unless you really want to see more of this, and leave a lot of comments as such, this is almost assured a one-off. Even for as much as I feel the content scene is lacking for newbies, I'm probably not the guy for it, nor the audience. Whether or not the realizations I've run into for making my FF content leads to more than just one idea I have and might do, we'll see. I still obviously have my doubts of my place, but still, not here for the pity party. Take care and may the power of Anna Did Hog slay waste to your enemies.